Okay, great. We will get started with today's event. Once again, thank you very much for joining us. Uh, my name is Vincent. I am a recruiter for the MBA in Cybersecurity Risk Management Program. And we're going to go ahead and get started with today's event. First, I want to thank you all for taking the time out of your day to attend the Cybersecurity Risks in the Age of AI webinar, sponsored by our MBA in Cybersecurity Risk Management Program at Florida International University. I will be introducing our panelists, and then we will go straight into our panelist presentation. We will then have a Q&A for our panelists, and I will go over the admission requirements for the program at the end of this event. If you have any questions for our panelists during the presentation, please feel free to write your questions directly in the chat box, and we will answer these questions during the Q&A after our presentation. Now, I wanted to introduce our special guests. Uh, thank you very much for attending this event, Dr. Yan Chen, who is an associate professor, writer, eminent scholar, chair in management information systems, and the faculty director of our MBA in cybersecurity risks management program in information systems and business analytics department at Florida International University. Dr. Yan Chen received her PhD degree in Management Information Systems from the University of Wisconsin in Milwaukee. And her research focuses on online fraud, security management, information privacy, social media analytics, and AI impact. And Dr. Yan Chen has published more than 40 research papers in refereed academic journals and conference proceedings. Our second guest will be Dr. Puyan Ismail Zadeh who serves as an assistant professor in the Department of Information Systems and Business Analytics in the College of Business at Florida International University. Dr. Puyan has established a line of research at the intersection of emerging technologies, such as AI and health informatics, focusing on the impact of health information technology on the performance of health systems, improving the quality and efficiency of career delivery, and enhancing the engagement of patients in managing their care. And Dr. Puyan received his PhD in management from the University of Putra, Malaysia in Malaysia. Now we'll hand that off to our guest speakers, Dr. Puyan. Yes, um, hello everyone. Uh, and uh, thanks for the, this session. And thanks for all the, many, uh, all the coordinators. So before we start off, I just want to ask you guys a question. I know that uh, most of you guys are interested in robotics and AI. So just uh, by typing uh, plus five, just tell me how many of you guys would like to have a like a personal AI robots, uh, robot, uh, like robotic assistant for healthcare purposes. Just type zero five so, uh, uh, or five, that's fine. I just want to see how many of you guys are really interested in AI in healthcare. And uh, so, and if you want, oh, I just, I just see lots of five. Yes, that's good, that's good. And also, I just want you, if you want, if you're if you also comfortable, please just type in the chat box. So what task would you delegate to this AI assistant in terms of healthcare? So what kind of task you would, uh, this AI uh, robot uh, gonna perform for you in terms of your healthcare manager? So then I'm gonna just talk about some of them when I just read uh, your uh, your notes. Uh, patient intake, yeah. <laughs> Reminders, appointment, that's exactly right. So let's just start with some de uh, some definitions. Uh, so AI, that's a very interesting hot topic these days. So what is exactly the AI? So AI can be anything, can be device, can be personal assistant, can be any type of technology, can be computer, can be software, anything that can uh, like imitate the thought process of human, the reasoning of human, even the action. So they can do lots of physical activity for you. So for example, if you just watch some of the, like Amazon, for example, warehouse, you're gonna see, uh, there are lots of, for example, robotic system that do, for example, uh, like lifting. Or also AI can do lots of things for cognitive function. For example, I'm gonna have some, some example here. So one of the, uh, one of the things that is not related to healthcare, for example, for cognitive function is that, so there are lots of AI powered uh, tools that bankers can use in order to, for example, approve your, uh, your loan, uh, for example, application or not. So this is another example. So uh, this is all the different types of tasks that can be done by AI 
And AI can be, can, is, is a very like a big umbrella term that covers lots of technology. Uh, can you move to the second uh, slide, please? Uh, so, uh, but because of the time and also the interest of uh, this, uh, this meeting, so, and the, this webinar, we just want to limit our uh, example to healthcare. So let's just talk about AI in healthcare. So why we need to use AI in healthcare? There are lots of reasons. So one of the most important reason is uh, precision management, so personalization. So based on AI, we are able to give you recommendation that is only for you, is not for anyone else. So that's a, pre that's a precision uh, for the management. So efficiency, we can, for example, use AI because uh, AI cannot, for example, get tired. So we can use it like, for example, ongoing. And the safety, so definitely AI can be used in some uh, very dangerous procedures or for example, just uh, you can use it uh, to deal with some hazardous, for example, materials and cost effectiveness definitely. So because the AI is just computer system and codes and some algorithms, so it can reduce the cost because you don't need to pay, for example, for uh, uh, so another person to deal, uh, to do all these activities and also improve uh, patient outcome. This is very important thing. So safety and the patient outcome is very important. So if you use AI, for example, you can reduce uh, some of the, like, for example, hospital stay uh, uh, and also recovery time can be faster. Can you go to the next one, please? So let's go to some use cases in AI. I just saw some of you guys who just uh, uh, have some examples of uh, the task that you want to delegate to AI. So let's have some of the real thing. Let's go and jump to the reality. So there are some example of AI in healthcare. One of the best example of AI is that AI can be used, uh, for example, for uh, understanding and interpreting, uh, interpreting, for example, lots of medical images, especially in radiology. So uh, this is a very good personal assistant for radiologists. And, and uh, just there is a, there is a, a like quote that lots of, for example, radiologists maybe uh, are kind of afraid of AI. Maybe AI can replace their job and something like that, that we're gonna talk about it. But this is one of the best example of using AI you know, in order to analyze and interpret, for example, medical images. And then they can identify some abnormal abnormalities in your images. So next. And uh, so I'm gonna talk about the clinical decision support system. This slide itself, so we can talk about it like 24 hours is, is a lot, but I just want to give you just a very, uh, uh, very simple definition. So clinical decision support system uh, powered by AI means that nowadays AI or artificial intelligence or any robotic system can help physicians to analyze and understand the sign and symptom of patient. And they're gonna give you some diagnostic option and care planning or treatment option. So this is called clinical decision support system. And clinical decision support system now is embedded in lots of medical tools that can be used by, uh, by healthcare professionals. And one of the examples, very recent uh, example, this is a company, it's called Glass AI. So you can Google, Google it and find it. So Glass AI just, uh, it's just mix of knowledge-based or and also non-knowledge-based uh, clinical decision support system can help uh, physicians to come up with some treatment option and care planning only for that specific case. So next. Then, uh, so there is another example of Google DeepMind. So maybe some of you guys have seen this and also the video for Google DeepMind. So this is another cool example of using AI, especially for eye uh, sc screening and also for cataract and lots of uh, eye uh, uh, disorders. So uh, deep uh, mind can uh, detect, for example, around 50 eye disorders. And I'm gonna, I'm gonna give you some recommendations how to, uh, how to treat this. And it's just using AI, it's just using AI. This is the, this is the uh, beauty of using AI in healthcare. So next. And another one, so this is very good for, uh, for, for example, for elderly and also for nursing homes. So if you want to use variables, for example, these variables that uh, they have AI in their, uh, in their, for example, algorithm, they can uh, completely monitor the patients and also their behavior, the AKG, for example, the, the, the uh, for example, medication, sleep quality and everything. 
And if there is any abnormalities or emergencies, they're gonna detect it and directly send the message to healthcare providers. And healthcare providers can uh, can uh, be involved in the in the situation. So this is another example. And one of the best example for this uh, is called Care Predict. This is another company that using IoT, Internet of Things, and variables and AI in order to monitor patients remotely. And in case of emergency, they're gonna detect it and find it and send alert to healthcare providers. Next. And another one, so uh, this is very cool and very, uh, uh, very uh, uh, potential application of uh, um, uh, AI in healthcare. So AI can, can analyze your genetic information and also your lifestyle and uh, based on your, uh, your information, they're gonna help, for example, healthcare providers to create, to suggest some personalized plan for you. They can even, for example, uh, uh, make some personalized medication just because of, for example, understanding your lifestyle and some genetic information. This is very, uh, very uh, cool example of uh, AI in healthcare. And you're gonna hear about it in future a lot. So next. So another one, so we have another example of AI, so chatbot, there are lots of AI powered chatbot, like for example, chat GPT that you guys use for everything. And we have something like conversational AI or generative AI or chatbot is only for uh, healthcare purposes. So for example, we have the AI, uh, it's called Bui. So this is uh, the AI, this is a chatbot uh, that you can uh, enter your sign and symptom and the chatbot gonna give you for example, some diagnostic and also some care planning just based on your sign and symptom that you enter. Something like, for example, whenever you develop some sign and symptom, you Google it. Now we can use, for example, some AI power chatbot that is de designated for healthcare. So the other one is that we have lots of conversational, uh, for example, uh, um, uh, chatbot can help you to manage chronic issues and chronic diseases. So Sensely is another example. Let's go to the next one. So, uh, and also we have another project that we have these days also, we have the chatbot for mental health. So, because one of the things that AI cannot, for example, uh, that many people said uh, that AI cannot enter is in emotional support. But these days we have lots of example of conversational AI that design only for managing mental health. So, Vobot is one of them, Replica is one of them, um, I strongly suggest you guys uh, uh, take a look at this website and also application and you can use it. So for example, for a stress man management, for depression, for anxiety, so you can chat with them and they're gonna send you some modification and for example, some quick chat and they're gonna understand you and just have some emotional support and something like this. This is uh, designed only for mental health and people that are suffering from some me mental disorder. Very cool applications, you can, you can check it out. Next. And so medical robotics. So we have robotic application in healthcare and I'm gonna have some examples. Uh, this is also a lot. We can have lots of application of AI in different healthcare tasks, for example, surgery, rehabilitation, diagnosis. I'm gonna give you some real life example. Let's, let's please, next. So let's just start with robotic surgery. So this is one of the real uh, life example. So it's called Da Vinci Surgical System. So lots of you guys are familiar. And the studies shows that, so using robotic surgery, especially for some, sur some surgery like prostate, so it just result better, uh, for example, uh, out uh, outcome. And the other one is, for example, for breast cancer. So AI or, or, or robotic system can detect and diagnose uh, breast cancer even better than healthcare providers. Next. So we have the, the other one. So uh, for uh, automating, for example, uh, blood collection. So this is another one. So you can use to automate all the procedure for data, for sorry, for, a blo for a blood collection. And also the, the other one is that the robotic system that you can use for rehabilitation. So people suffering from any, uh, for example, walking issues or after uh, stroke or after, for example, any uh, injury or accident, they can use robot for rehabilitation purposes. Next. So, and these are uh, some other examples. I'm, I'm gonna talk about some robotics again. So uh, the three examples, 
uh, is the company robot, Robotic Pets and also Virtual Reality Trophy Solution. This is mainly, I'm gonna just try to have this example mainly for elderly, mainly for uh, age tech. So the technology, the AI powered technology that is designed for older adults. So next. So this, uh, these are some of the examples. Also, I strongly suggest you guys Google this, this uh, robotic system. LEQ and also Zora. So these are some of the uh, uh, robotic uh, systems. So companion robot that are gonna help, for example, elderly uh, for uh, that they are suffering, for example, from any uh, like uh, physical or mental diseases, or for example, they send some reminders or they try to tell some jokes or try to have some entertainment, play chess or play music for them. And so if they have any mobility assistant, they, uh, they, if they need any mobility assistant, they can also provide. So next. And also we have robotic pets. Uh, so we have Abel is on the left side and also the Paro is the, the on the right side. So this is the robotic dog and also robotic seal. So these are again, uh, designed, for example, for in, uh, for interacting with elderly and also some emotional support. And uh, para, para is uh, mainly designed for uh, cognitive disorders. Next. So virtual reality, that's another cool example of uh, AI powered uh, tool is, is virtual reality in physical therapy. I'm not sure how many of you guys uh, experience physical therapy. One of the problem of physical therapy is that it's not exactly designed for you is most of them are very general, very general. So it's not designed based on your specific needs or ability. And so virtual reality try to use some gamification also virtual reality elements in order to have some a game like uh, an immersive experience for you. And so, and uh, through the uh, uh, therapy uh, 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 sessions, it gonna uh, give you a kind of a score and also the progress score and is designed only based on your needs and ability. That's another one. So let's go to the next one. And so, yeah, these are all the cool things. There are lots of benefits, but there are any risks? Yes, definitely. There are lots of risk. So because AI is nothing but some codes, is nothing but some algorithm. So we have lots of privacy, security, ethical issues. So how much data are you gonna collect? If the chatbot is collecting data, so how much, uh, how much, uh, for example, uh, your, you can ensure me that my data is protected against unauthorized access or second use of data and also some vulnerability issues uh, to uh, cybersecurity. So next, um, we're going to talk about some examples, but let's uh, move to the next one. And I'm going to ask Yan to, uh, to, con to continue. Thank you very much. Yeah, and can you, uh, do you want to continue? Yes, yes, Please. I'm trying to find my video and yeah. Thank you, Po Yang, for uh, bringing us interesting insight into AI use and its impact in healthcare. And now I would like to talk about the rise of uh, generative AI use in business. And such AI can generate new and meaningful content from training data. Please pay attention to the two key words in this definition, new and meaningful. New means that generative AI can create a new content that never existed before, such as a new report, a new piece of music, and a new drawing. Meaningful refers to what created is not nonsense and makes sense to human beings. Depending on the uh, training data and the models, generative AI can create a high quality and uh, accurate output with the human level or even better than human level performance if they are trained with uh, uh, domain specific models and the data, they may achieve expert level performance. Um, po Yang just mentioned some of such applications in healthcare. Next one. Um, there are many potential applications of uh, generative AI in business. 
the first type of application is to provide a chatbot customer service that can reach the quality of the call centers in real world or even exceeded it. We all have the experience that when a chatbot provides endless and useless answers to your questions, you want to scream, I want to talk to a real person. Um, generative AI can change this situation. Um, they can understand customers' complex questions and provide accurate answers. Uh, when integrating with avatar, voice, and uh, virtual reality, uh, such chatbots can provide high-quality, immersive, human-like customer services. We already have the case in the real world that a CEO replaced 90% of support staff with an AI chatbot. Uh, Paul Young also mentioned some cool um, use of chatbots in the uh, healthcare. The second use is that generative AI may provide content generation and the creative writing services. They can take over most office routine work, such as uh, uh, writing reports, presentations, and uh, contracts. Um, they also can provide the creative content generation services, such as uh, uh, novel writing, film script writing, music composition, and uh, creative drawing. People are already thrilled by some AI-generated products. I don't know if you have watched a movie called uh, Frost, which is a, a 12 minutes movie with all its frame generated by AI. Have you heard a song called Not Mine? Anyone? Have you heard that song? So, the song is uh, created by, singed by an uh, AI avatar called Mikula on Instagram. So if you haven't heard it, you can go there to, to listen to it. Next one. Um, generative AI may also do creative design to assist human beings to design uh, such as new products new drugs, uh, new chips, and uh, new materials. Because they are trained on huge amounts uh, of data, so they have the knowledge to combine information, information and uh, discover news. So that leads to the next use of uh, uh, generative AI, which is uh, e-discovery. So you can use uh, um, generative AI to search a large, large amount of information. And uh, then you can use them to do the scientific research. We all know scientists spend a lot of their valuable time searching and reviewing literature, identify research gaps. So AI actually can do such work for scientists and they even can suggest the new research directions. So uh, scientists can spend their valuable time on creative work, on real research work. Um, generative AI may fundamentally change education in terms of who to teach, how to teach, and what to learn. Um, Avatars powered by generative AI may replace the human ed uh, educators to provide personalized training and education, and they may greatly change the curriculum for, uh, from K-12 to, to higher education. Uh, think about 90% uh, uh, of existing job will be replaced by AI. Students and uh, educators need have the new skills um, to face this new world. Next one. But we also have to be cautious. Generative AI can be explored for malicious and fraudulent use. 
we have already seen some of user cases. Uh, one use case is to use generative AI to generate highly targeted phishing and the social engineering fraud. Um, last month, a mother testified her horror experience at a US Senate hearing about being blackmailed by scammer claiming that they had kidnapped her 15 year old daughter and asked for $1 million ransom payment. Scammers use AI to deepfake her daughter's voice to make the kidnap, uh, kidnap convincing. Um, there's also a social media report about uh, AI deepfake CEO um, using uh, uh, deepfake video and uh, audio to uh, scan money from companies. So those are the uh, con general concerns. There's also general concerns about uh, a malicious third party to use generative AI to generate malicious code or find innovative ways of, of attacking and then use them to launch more frequent and more sophisticated security attacks. Because of the broad range of uh, um, capabilities of uh, gen generative AI, many companies plan to integrate them into business. So this can open a gate for new exports because many unknown threat vector may emerge. There's also a concern about uh, AI hallucination have you heard about this term before, anyone? So the AI hallucination means that AI can create fake information uh, intentionally or unintentionally. So it's very, very dangerous that we make decisions based on such information. The malicious parties can also intentionally explore uh, the generative nature of AI to create fake information. For example, state and nations can use generative AI to generate and post large amount of fake news and mis misinformation on the internet to manipulate such as elections, stock market. Um, next slide. So those malicious and fraudulent use cases suggest several uh, main cybersecurity risks brought by uh, generative AI. The first is information leak. Um, so if the model is trained on sensitive data such as the patient data, customer data, it may leak such information in the output of the model. And malicious parties can also intentionally explore this and access the sensitive data. Um, second the concern is the generation of the misinformation and uh, uh, disinformation by AI, or we call the AI hallucination. As I just mentioned, um, there's uh, many ways to explore generated AI to create uh, such uh, misinformation and uh, disinformation. The third threat is AI manipulation that various parties can uh, intentionally manipulate the AI to generate harmful and biased content for various purposes. For example, uh, generate racially biased content and uh, analysis report. Mm. The last one is impersonation um, through deep fake power by the generated AI. I already uh, mentioned the one case, uh, the kidnap case. Um, next one. Um, there are other risks brought by the generated AI. The first risk is uh, um, patent and copyright infringement. 
um, AI models are trained with massive data that may include a patent and a copyrighted data. And they may use them to create a content that runs the risk of uh, uh, patent and uh, copyright infringement. The second is a privacy violation. Um, since generated AI uses sensitive information, most of the time without the owner's uh, concern. So that means uh, the outcome provided by generated AI sometimes can violate your privacy. Um, the third, we already mentioned, they can generate a biased content and uh, make biased decisions due to uh, an intentionally uh, faulty design or intentionally exploitation by uh, malicious parties. Um, there could be a great area of use. We already uh, uh, seen them in the real world, for example, can students use a generative AI such as chat GPT to check and improve their writing? Uh, can employee use generative AI to do their work? Can junior lawyers or paralegals uh, uh, to use generative AI to prepare cases? Can judges use generative AI to assist rulings um, who are responsible for these results? And can they claim um, those output or the output assisted by the uh, generative AI as their own? So those are just examples of uh, applications of uh, uh, generative AI, regardless of the intention, the good or the bad. Um, there will be many, many of uh, such applications that require your imagination. So now I turn the floor to Paul Yan again. Uh, he's, talk, he's going to talk about uh, other concerns in the healthcare. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Uh, so let's, yeah, you, you heard uh, some of the potential concerns uh, that we have for, we generate uh, with uh, like a new type of AI. But the thing is that so AI is all this example, I just want to mention that we are still in the very earliest stage of AI. So it's very early stage. So we are just talking about the weak area. So like uh, like uh, and, and like narrow AI. So we still lots of potential that we could talk about. Let's just talk about some of the main concerns. Some of the concern that Jan also mentioned. I'm gonna just uh, try to have it in the in the healthcare. Okay. So if we're gonna use AI, some of the concern that we're gonna have from both perspective, the healthcare professionals and also the patient. So if I want to use robotics or for example, robotic system or, or conversational AI for managing my healthcare. So some of the con some of concern uh, is the privacy concern, definitely. So because these are all the, uh, my personal health information, all of them are sensitive. I just want to know how much uh, data the chat bot or the AI will collect from my house, from me, from my relationship and how they're gonna use it. And the security, so I'm not sure if the, the AI model or the algorithm is completely uh, safe and is I'm not sure if it's vulnerable or not to some hacking or cybersecurity threats. And the ethical concern, so if you use AI too much, so the problem is that there are lots of uh, debate and also concern about you, you are losing your social interaction and it's gonna lead you to social isolation. So at the end of the day, is you and your robot. And in future, it's gonna be the same thing, but I'm, I'm, I'm not completely sure, but this is my guess. But now we have some ethical concerns. So next. And also dependence, if you use AI too much, so also we're gonna lose your self uh, suffocacy. Self suffocacy is very important term, guys. It's very important term. It means that so if you don't have AI around you, you think you cannot do the task. I'm gonna give you one example. Like for example, maybe there are some student or some some people they just want to write an essay, and the first thing they do they just type in the chat GPT, and when the chat GPT is is not around or if they cannot access it, so they cannot even start it. That's a, that's a very important point. So it means they are losing 
you are losing your writing skills because you, you try to rely too much on AI and also gener generative AI. The cost concern, some of these AI tools are, are not very, uh, like for example, cheap for many people. So that's the, that's the problem. Or, so, or lots of people cannot access it. So maybe because of limited, uh, for example, literacy or medical literacy, they cannot access it or they're, they're not aware of them. And maintenance concerns. So AI is device, is personal assistant, is uh, like the, the device needs some uh, maintenance in terms of software or hardware and for lots of people is, is a big deal. And the training, some of this AI is not very easy to use and you need to know how to function it well. Otherwise, we're gonna have bad users and bad users yield bad outcome. Next. And so let's let's turn the page and let's go to the perspective from the perspective of healthcare providers. They also have the privacy and security concerns. So uh, because most of the time, so the AI is just, uh, is just built by developers, is not by healthcare providers. Healthcare providers are users. They just use it. So, but they don't actually know the algorithm and the mechanism or the security measures or the safeguard, they don't know. So that's why they also have this privacy and security concern. So, and the other concern for healthcare is that if healthcare providers use uh, AI too much, also they're gonna lose the critical thinking. They're gonna lo lose some of the decision-making, for example, uh, skills, or some of the, for example, clinical judgment. So you cannot just use AI for everything. At the end of the day, you as a, as a healthcare provider, so you need to make the final decision based on your experience. And the bias, so Jan just uh, well explained everything related to bias in, in, in data because, uh, so AI is nothing but algorithm. And also AI should be trained on data. And if the data is biased, so definitely the algorithm gonna, gonna amplify this bias and the result is gonna be biased completely. Next, please. Then lack of transparency. This is one of the problems uh, for everyone. So how the AI works actually? What is inside the AI? What does that mean, the machine learning? I don't understand machine learning. I don't understand, uh, for example, neural networking. So what does that mean uh, actually? So that's why, because lots of people uh, don't know the decision process of the AI. So it's kind of black box for them. And, uh, and lack of transparency means lack of trust. And this is very important. If you don't trust tool, a tool, you cannot use it. And one of the most important problem that we usually have uh, when you want to implement AI tools in a healthcare setting is, is the lack of uh, 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 transparency about accountability. Who is responsible if the if, for example, a healthcare provider or a doctor, for example, use AI and the AI, for example, give a wrong, uh, for example, diagnosis or or treatment option or care planning? Who is responsible? The developer of AI, the hospital manager who approved use of AI in hospital, the healthcare providers. Who who is responsible? Is not actually very clear. So we need to have new version of rules and regulation related to responsible use of AI in order to ensure safe and responsibility of use, use of AI. Next. Uh, so some of the changes needed uh, for AI in healthcare. So first of all, all these tools and AI and mechanisms, so whatever we call it should be uh, tested and validated based on a serious uh, uh, sets of uh, studies, clinical studies in order to be validated and in order to make sure we have reliable AI to be used. And education, so next generation of healthcare providers and doctors need to be trained how to use AI. So there are two types of people in, in, in future. So the people who use AI well, and they understand how to use AI, they understand the function of AI, they understand how to interpret the AI. And the second people is that the people who actually develop AI. So now it's your decision. So who gonna be? you in future you're gonna be good user or you're gonna be good developer so if you don't want to be developer at least you need to be trained how to use it well right so this is a competitive advantage for healthcare providers so in next uh, next generation 
of uh, healthcare provider training. So definitely beside the medical literature, they need to be trained on AI too. That's my prediction. And ethical and legal consideration, definitely, as I mentioned, we need to have some new rules and regulation how to use AI, especially in healthcare, something like HIPAA that they have for privacy and security. So we need to have something this designated for healthcare and also this setting and the cybersecurity measure that uh, Jan also mentioned. Next. So uh, the, the, maybe the last thing I want to mention is that, so as you heard so far, there are lots of benefits, there are lots of advantages, but there are lots of issues definitely related to cybersecurity attack, uh, the data breaches, and also the, uh, the what type of security policies you want to Im embed in your AI system and algorithms. So how are we gonna detect, for example, bias? And uh, so how are we gonna make sure the data is protected against unauthorized access or, or data tampering or, on a, or for example, second use of data. These are all the problems that is all about the training on cybersecurity. So AI is very important, but understanding the cybersecurity point of view also is very important. Next. Um, so AI will replace your job in healthcare. That's a very uh, difficult question to answer now. Uh, now, uh, because AI can uh, replace lots of repetitive job, definitely lots of administrative job in healthcare, like for example, data entry, like coding or a scheduling appointment. But at the end of the day, so the, the secret is that, so we still need someone in order to use uh, clinical judgment, in order to use experience and uh, the decision making to make the final decision and the treatment for you. So, and also we need uh, emotional intelligence. We need, we still need, uh, for example, social support and emotional support. Lots of people are not comfortable in order to, for example, get uh, or, or obtain emotional support from a robot or AI system or chatbot. They want to talk to someone. So they still need to have uh, like uh, facial, for example, uh, uh, cues. They want to see you. They want to talk to you. They want to. Uh, they want someone to understand them. So that's the emotional intelligence. That's the support. That's the compassion. That's the. This is the thing that we cannot replace. Um, uh, uh, for AI cannot replace. Maybe in future. Maybe in future we're gonna have uh, some. Uh, uh, for example. Uh, artificial general intelligence that can provide all these things, but not now. Now we still need have someone, for example, to make the final decision based on all these uh, clinical uh, uh, expertise and skills. Next. I, uh, yeah, so Jan, would you uh, yes. continue, yeah. please? So um, a general question is that will AI replace your job? The answer is yes and no. Um, based on a uh, 2013 uh, study from- Say so where uh, you had the telephone uh, account. I mean, I see. Something that- Sorry? Sorry, I got interrupted. Will AI replace your job in general? The answer is yes and no. Um, based on a 2013 study from uh, University uh, of Oxford. It suggests that 47% uh, of US job can be eliminated by AI over the uh, next 20 years. Uh, with the rise of the generative AI, some new discussion on the internet suggests 90%. So regardless of the percentage, we definitely know that many jobs will be eliminated by AI in the near future. Uh, AI uh, replaces mostly those repetitive jobs, but uh, uh, new jobs related to AI will emerge. Generally speaking, AI cannot replace jobs that require human judgment, uh, emotions, and other uh, human-related uh, factors. Uh, information security-related jobs, such as uh, security analyst, uh, security manager and the chief information security officers are one of uh, such jobs because security is a complex issue involving technologies, people, laws, regulations, and ethics. Next one.
So do we need to be afraid of AI? The answer, again, the answer is yes and no. Yes, facing this disruptive technology, we must be cautioned. There could be dangerous and disruptive use of such technology. For example, state nation and the terrorists may use generative AI to create new biochemical weapons. Uh, what will society do when 90% of existing jobs are eliminated by AI and the human face uh, uh, AI transformed the world. We may need to create a new social structure, new economy, new laws, and new regulations to govern the AI-powered society. Um, as an individual, you should be prepared and ready with uh, skills for such a world. And uh, a master program in MBA in cybersecurity management may help you to get some skills that you need for such a society. Next. So thank you for listening to us. Any questions for us? Yes, thank you very much, Dr. Chen and Dr. Puyan. Yes, absolutely. We have a question here in the chat box from uh, Dr. Hendris Vici. Uh, thank you for joining us today, doctor. His question was about AI is great, great innovation, but AI makes plagiarism harder to detect. Any feedback? Well, um, some um, experts mentioned this. Um, so they try to develop an algorithm that uh, can be traced back uh, to any decisions uh, that generated by AI. So that means uh, starting from the data you input, you need to um, put a lot of uh, that's a non AI human effort <laughs> to examine the data to make sure you don't have a garbage in and a garbage out. That's a very, very um, tedious job. Think about, uh, for example, you use AI to hire somebody, and the traditionally coding is dominated by a uh, uh, male. And then you use AI to do the hiring and the, the AI trained by the data, they may create a biased decision to hire, a, hire more male than female candidates. So human beings have to interfere during this process. So uh, we cannot 100% uh, rely on data uh, and the AI without knowing why they make these decisions. Thank you, Dr. Chen. Did you want to add something, Dr. Puyan, maybe? Uh, I, I just want to add something uh, about the plagiarism that uh, you mentioned, especially in if you are talking about education. And also, um, so for example, writing essay for a student or something like that, you know, uh, maybe it's not a very popular opinion, but what I, what I uh, actually believe that, so we need to think of, uh, uh, big uh, change in how a student learn and how, uh, uh, for example, educator teach. So we cannot use, for example, the very traditional way of writing essays or something like that. We need to have some new experience, right? So something that make us different from uh, like AI or robotic system is that, so we need to have some experience, new experience, something that people cannot find over the internet or by chatting with AI. So that's the experience that we need to, we need to have in classes because there is no doubt, you know, you cannot, uh, this, is, this is my idea. So you cannot uh, uh, stop, uh, uh, for example, you cannot stop waves or, or an also ocean uh, to reach the coast. You cannot do that, right? So, but the way that you can manage it, that's your art. So we, I think I, I actually believe that we need to have big transformation in how we teach a student and how a student actually learn. Is this all based on essay or is all based on also just uh, like, for example, writing? So that's the new type of experience. And beside that, yes, there are some uh, there are some software can detect plagiarism based on element uh, based on, for example, Chat GPT and also other uh, generative AI that you can detect it, but I think we need to we need to think big. We need to have different vision. That's my idea. 
Thank you, Dr. Poyan. Uh, we also have another candidate, who uh, Rico Randall, who expressed to us that he would love to discuss having you on his show to raise awareness for his listeners. So we have his contact information uh, that we'll send to you uh, after this webinar. We also have another question from Dr. Heinrich Vici. Uh, I believe that USA needs to start a better GDPR policies and procedures for AI and data privacy. Please feedback. Yeah, I totally agree with that. Uh, actually, Peng Yang uh, mentioned in some cases when uh, doctors and the nurses do use uh, um, chat GBT and other uh, generated AI to make uh, medical decisions, who is going to be responsible for the outcome if there is a male practice? Uh, is the AI or the doctor or the nurse? And we need to have a regulation on such kind of uh, uh, cases. We also need to have a regulation and ethic about uh, um, a malicious use, like I said, um, because the generative nature, uh, they can generate uh, some unexpected outcome, for example, by a chemical weapon and the new design that could harm uh, human race. So we have to have regulations and ethics uh, to create the call uh, um, zero error uh, AI. Uh, all the, all the a, uh, error are traceable AI. So we need to uh, develop mechanism, regulations, and technology to do so. Yes, Dr. Puyan, if you wanted to add something. Uh, no, the answer is, the answer is com complete. I, I don't want to add anything. That's completely right. We need to have new uh, types of ger new generation of regulation and rules and ethical standards in all, in all uh, industries, specifically in some industry like banking, like, for example, healthcare that are dealing with financial information and very sensitive personal health information. That's completely right. Thank you very much. Another question that we have in our chat box, uh, what would be the first steps in developing terms and conditions for AI use in the banking and compliance risk analyst industry? Well, um, I'm not the expert in the banking industry, but uh, based on some uh, general discussion about the business use, I think we already mentioned that uh, uh, like, uh, uh, create uh, uh, for provide the customer services, uh, provide uh, financial uh, analysis and the, uh, analysis and the forecast, and uh, they also can build the AI model to model uh, financial risk. Um, but uh, at the same time, you have to be careful about using uh, those models when you train on the similar models. We already have that case when decisions are based on the similar algorithm, they also can cause new problems. If I want to add uh, to what uh, Dr. Yan mentioned, so especially in banking, so we can, we can talk about AI a lot and also the use of AI. So, but because you mentioned some of the first like terms and conditions, the first thing I would say is that, so first of all, the AI that you're going to use in banking, so the algorithm should be very clear because, for example, the, the thing that I mentioned before, so we can use AI, um, for example, tool in order to, for example, accept or reject your loan application just based on pattern recognition. And this algorithm most of the time is biased. So it's biased. And this the wrong algorithm can have wrong, for example, uh, decision for bankers. And this is something that should be, should be uh, paid attention of. So this is very important. How are we gonna, how are we gonna uh, uh, make sure we have the right algorithm for some banking decision? And also for compliance risk, And all, there are lots of AI in order to detect uh, security and uh, the security issues and also uh, uh, the cyber security attack, especially in banking and some other industries. This is another thing that you can use uh, for example, uh, uh, for 
uh, bankers. But the main thing also, as I mentioned, as, uh, as Jan also mentioned, we can use AI in banking for customer service. We can automate lots of administrative jobs that, for example, bankers can do. So then bankers can, can uh, spend their time in some more complex, for example, decision making. Thank you, Dr. Puyan. Yes. If uh, any candidates still have some questions, please feel free to write them in the chat box. Uh, we are just going to move on to the next slide as uh, once again, this program was sponsored by our online MBA in cybersecurity risk management here at Florida International University. So just to give you a further more information about our program and the admission requirements, uh, we'll wait maybe for other questions. Uh, so the classes for this program will begin every uh, fall semester, so in August, but only this semester, this program will start in October. So if you are interested in applying for our program, please do so. We are still accepting students. Uh, it is very easy. It is a fully online program, uh, 20 months to graduate with synchronous courses, meaning that you will have live classes with our professors and other students. Uh, during the program on Mondays and Wednesdays from 6.30 to 9.30 p.m. And this program is as well a STEM designated program, which of course adds value uh, once you will obtain this MBA program. In terms of the admission requirements, very easy to apply for our program, just go to our website, but I will be sending you also this information via email. Just click on the link, it takes five to 10 minutes to create a profile and to send in your application. And what our admissions committee is going to be looking for in applicants is uh, candidates who have a demonstrating four years of work experience in cybersecurity, information systems, or a related field. So we are looking for experienced candidates in this domain for this program. Uh, so please feel free to send me your resume if you would like to uh, before applying. I can send it to our admissions committee for them to review uh, your resume to confirm you would be a great candidate or you could also apply, attach your resume, and of course, I would forward it afterwards. Otherwise, uh, other documents that will be required, of course, are transcripts, statement of purpose, and uh, English proficiency test if you did not graduate from a, sorry, from a university in the US. But once again, I will be sending you all these documents and all this information via email later on today or tomorrow with further information on the program and also my contact information in case you would have any further questions or if you would like to schedule an in-person meeting. And you can also find more information as well on our website right here at the bottom, which is at mbacyber.fiu.edu. Now I know that we have other questions. Uh, yes, for Dr. Pui and Dr. Chen, what are the, oh, no, sorry, that would be for me. What are the requirements to apply for this MBA? Uh, so this is what we just went through, yes. So it is really, once again, uh, work experience oriented because admissions committee looks for candidates with two to four years of work experience in cybersecurity or related field. And then the second mandatory requirement would be, of course, a bachelor's degree. Yeah. So the accreditation, of course, very good question. We are AACSB accredited here at FIU. All our MBAs are AACSB accredited, which is an accreditation that is earned by uh, fewer than 5% of the world's business school. And of course, it will uh, ensure the, business, the education you will be receiving here at FIU. And all our classes, as you will see, once you're a student at FIU, will be taught by our professors. Who all, of course, have PhD and many years, as you can see here with this presentation today, in the cybersecurity field. Thank you, Dr. Andrews Vichy, for attending today. Yes. Did we have any further questions regarding uh, the presentation from our guest speakers, Dr. Yanchen and Dr. Puyan? Okay, great. Well, thank you very much for attending today's event. Thank you, of course, to Dr. Chen and to Dr. Puyan uh, for your presentations. It was really great, great information in terms of cybersecurity risks in the age of AI. And once again, all of, for all the uh, attendees today, I will be sending you an email with further information uh, on our programs. And do not hesitate to reach out to us uh, if you need any further information. Thank you all and have a great rest of your day. Thank Bye, everyone. you for joining us today. Thanks everybody. Thank you, Dr. Chen. Thank you, Diana. Thank you.
Thank you, Angel. Thank you, Paul Yang. Thank you very much. It's my great pleasure. Thank you very much. Exciting. Thank you to Thank both you. of you. Yes. Prince, you want to stop the recording?